Today's uh, presentation is about uh, kind of what's going on in the market, and uh, if I can get this all turned on, it's also different than in years past. I've done this a number of times up here, and uh, in the past, it's been a presentation that was pretty much like the year before in the sense that we're in Austin, everything's very good, and everything's uh, going really well. To, some, to a very large degree, that's the same presentation again today. I will show you how the numbers for 2015 were excellent, how most things are indicating that it's going to be a really good year for next year. But as my presentation title kind of indicates, there's some other influences going on out there that uh, are going to impact us possibly. And so you kind of need to factor that into what you're looking at. So. This is a much smaller presentation than in the past. I condensed probably 15 slides of charts and graphs and everything else into one table and one slide that, you, that we'll just kind of talk about and summarize. This is the beginning of those, actually, two slides. Uh, first, the good, what's going on in the Austin market. We're very much a city that's driven by population and job growth. We have a lot of population coming in. Over the last 10 years, we've averaged having 53,000 new residents. That's either births over deaths or that's in migration of young, highly educated, highly motivated population growth. And that pool of people that keeps coming in every single year has pulled lots of employers in. So that's been kind of the big bullet point takeaway that about Austin for quite a while. This last year, we didn't have 53,000. We had 67,000 new residents come into the market. And those new residents were all of the very much, uh, a very high degree, high percentage of them had BA degrees, master degrees. Uh, they're high tech, high, uh, they're focused on the things that are uh, what employers are wanting. So it just means it just draws even, even more employers in. So population growth very strong for Texas and Austin. Part of our big advantage of being in Austin is that we're in Texas. Texas is a very pro-business state, has been for 10 years, has been for 20 years, and that has uh, become more important the last four or five years, really since the recession, just because other states did not react nearly as uh, successfully to the recession is what Texas did. Texas has been balancing its budget throughout the entire recession. Other states are running billions of dollars of deficits. That causes them to drop the number of services they have. It causes them to raise their tax rates, which only drives businesses out more. California, anyone from California here? Raise your hands. Yeah. All right. So I love your state. I love to go visit it, but they're doing everything they can to drive all the businesses out of that state as fast as they can. So. And we're, all, and we're very grateful for that because Texas is the beneficiary of that. Job growth, very good for Texas, great for Austin. We have had phenomenally good job growth this last year. We are projected to have phenomenally good job growth this next year. So I'm going to talk about some bad and some ugly stuff, but don't forget these two really important things. Uh, we'll get into some of the details about job growth, but in the big picture, we just really have, uh, have many things going for us. Our demographics for Austin are very positive. We have a young and an educated, a, po a very positively motivated workforce. That is the single thing that drives employers to relocate companies here or open up regional centers here. They go look at Denver. They go look at Portland. They go look at Raleigh, North Carolina and the Research Triangle. They go look at uh, Florida, Phoenix, other places on the East Coast. And no one measures up to us for having the kind of workforce that they want. Uh, the biggest challenge we have with the workforce is that our unemployment is too low. We're running around a 3%, 3.5% unemployment rate year in, year out. And they look at that and they go, well, there's a great workforce here, but they're already all hired. We, I, there's no one for me to hire. So that's the, probably the biggest struggle that they have when they look at this market. Uh, companies like Oracle, oh my goodness. That's 50,000 square feet of space that Oracle is taking down. That's 2,000 employees they're going to hire. All of them are high-tech employees, uh, all making six figures and above, uh, or the vast majority of them. Uh, this is a major initiative for Oracle. They're moving their uh, services to the cloud, and they're doing that with the major initiative here in Austin. It doesn't get any better than that. Those are the best jobs in the nation right there. 
Uh, the Keep Austin Weird culture just continues to attract the workforce. So, you know, back whenever I got into the workforce a few years back, uh, employers would say, well, I want to hire you and we'll relocate you to our, our home office or to where we want you to work. Today, you go to the, your best employees that are going to make your company. You say, I want to hire you and I'll relocate you. And they go, nah, I don't think so. If you want to hire me, let me work from home or let me work remotely or let me, or you put a center in here and you hire me that way. And employers go, okay, so you see Apple, you see Facebook, you see GM Research Center, you see all these different companies opening up uh, regional centers here to be able to tap into that workforce. So this culture is one that attracts that type of worker and it's getting more so. Our reputation 10 years ago was really large and everyone knew about Austin. Just think how much that's changed with the F1, with South by Southwest, with just the national news that Austin uh, achieves, how much more that attracts those employees and employers. So that's, the, the, that's more of the good, the huge driving issue. Uh, music festivals just continue to grow in their size and in their economic impact. You're now up to about a $5 billion impact on Austin that the music culture, the music festivals have. In this, uh, in this city. That's not trivial. That is a phenomenal impact on it. And it also means it attracts some of the best music festivals, which is what attracts the employees that want to relocate here, uh, much, much of them the millennials. Uh, we're running around from an educated standpoint. Uh, the people that are in that workforce age group that uh, the employers want are running around 43, 45% of that population has got a bachelor's degree. Uh, that's one of the highest percentages of any city in the United States. And all this uh, whole uh, presentation will be sent out to you right after this. Melissa will be sending this out to everyone. So you're welcome to take some pictures of the slides, but you also will get the entire uh, handout right after this. Um, let's talk about the medical school and the teaching hospital. Uh, this is, you, you go to, you drive down and you see all the, if anyone driven by UT and you've seen all the cranes, there's, I've lost track, I think there's at least seven cranes down there now, maybe more, in just the, where the medical center is being built. This is really dynamic. This is unusual. There's no other place in the United States where you're taking a teaching hospital and a medical school and building them out of the ground at the same time so that they're all designed to work really well together. Operating theaters, able to be, able to, able to be accessed by virtual environments, by uh, direct observation, uh, the teaching rounds that are set up in the hospital and the school are all designed to be very compatible with each other. It's really the first time it's ever been done. That's, that alone is $500 million for the construction that's going on down there, much less the additional hospitals and other facilities that are being created, uh, medical office parks, much less all the spinoff biotech and venture capital. We had a record amount of venture capital invested last year in startup ventures here in Austin. Uh, we're not Silicon Valley, but we are not, we're in the top 10. We're not trivial about the kind of investment that goes on. 20% investment is all dedicated to biotech, and that's only going to grow as this continues to come out of the ground. So these are some of the very positive things that are going on in the Austin market. Results in, uh, we'll look at Austin and Texas for 2015, and then we'll look at uh, what's going to be happening in, in 2016. So new residents. Look at what Texas brought in, 500,000 new residents in Texas. We're growing that much new residents every year. We're 26, 27 million population in Texas. 35 years, we're going to be at 53, 55 million population in Texas. We'll be the largest, most populous state. Uh, at some point over that 35 years, we'll pass California. Uh, Austin, again, I said 67,000 residents. Uh, that was a maybe not a record, but really close to it, and it's way above what the average has been. Um, that's just a really good sign for your business. All those people need a home, need some place to live. Uh, projected for next year, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say we're going to have a record year for new population, people moving here. There's so many things that drive that. We could have a slowdown. We could have some challenges here, and people would still want to move here because guess what? Every place else, having more issues. So when they look at what the job opportunities are in whatever market they're in, and they look at, at Austin, and all they see is this is going to be a better place to come to for jobs 
They're doing a better job at creating jobs. They're doing a better job at creating good jobs. The total population, I already talked about that. We passed 2 million in Austin. Um, that will just continue to grow. We'll add those additional 70,000. Population growth rate, the whole country is growing a less than 1% uh, growth rate, which is good. That's a positive uh, uh, growth rate for, a, for the U.S. We used to be around 1%, a little over 1%. We're kind of below that now as we get bigger in the 330 million range. It's getting harder to maintain a 1% growth rate. Texas has consistently for four decades been growing around 2% uh, growth rate. And Austin has been very consistently growing around 3%. We can do a little more than that uh, every year. So uh, you look back at Austin uh, 1980 when I first got started in this business, we were about 500,000 population. We grew, uh, we're now at 2 million and we're growing by 70,000, uh, 67 to 70,000 a year. Pretty dramatic change in what the size of Austin has been over that period of time. So if you're going to have 67,000 people move here, how many jobs do you need for that group? You don't have to have a job, seven, you don't have 67,000 jobs because you're going to have, create a household, not everybody in the household is going to have a job. You're going to have about two and a half people per household. So we drop down here, have about two and a half people in, you needed for, or that are going to be created in each household. So you need about one job per household. So let's look at how many households that we're going to create. If we have two and a half people per household, that's the census. Austin might actually be a little less than that. It's such a young population and single population, it might be more like about 2.4. So if it's around two and a half, we'll just use that number. If we have 67,000 people moving here, we need to create 27,000 households, places for them to live. That's either rental or that's a single family or a condo or a townhome. Yes, I got a question. That's the population of Texas. So this is Texas. Okay. So that's the whole population of Texas. So I'm comparing Texas and Austin for 2015, then I'm going to look at Austin for 2016. Okay. So if we, need, if we have 67,000 people and we have two and a half people per household, you need 27,000 places for them to live. How many jobs do you need? You need about that many jobs to take care of that many households. So you need about at least 27,000 jobs. How many jobs did we create last year? Look at this. If you don't think that's not a healthy market, it doesn't get any better than this. There is no, every single community out there in the United States would kill to have this level of job creation year in, year out. We had some uh, markets that created more jobs than we did percentage-wise, percentage job growth rate, but they haven't done it year in, year out. They've done it the, like the last two to three years. We've been the number one job market for you know, five of the last seven years. We were not the number one now because there are some other markets that have heated up, but only in the last couple of years. We've been doing this 3.4% job growth rate for the last seven years. We've been right at the three, 2.9 at the lowest, 3.4. I've seen it be as high as 3.9%. So we continue to see this number go up. So we created plenty of jobs. Everyone who wants a job can get a job in the, in the city. Even my son who's in college, could get a job if he just go out and ask for it. He could get a job. <laughs> so it's very, that is a very, very solid job market. Unemployment rate, 3.3%. Like I said, that's actually too tight. It's very difficult on employers trying to look at relocating and seeing a market that's 3%, 3.5%. They'd rather see 4 or 4.5%. 4 in my, my mind and, and all the stuff I read, I think 4.5% is probably full employment. You get down to 3%, 3.5%, you're, you're beyond full employment. You're into, we're competing on salaries, and salaries are getting forced up, which employers don't necessarily like to see, uh, be in a market that's seeing uh, the, uh, that kind of uh, unemployment rate. So if that's the case, that we need to create 27,000 households, how did we do last year? So in Austin 2015, we had 67,000 people move in. We needed to create 27,000 households. How do we do? Well, we created 11,500 new homes that got completed. We got completed 9,500 apartment units. So we created 21,000. So if we need to create 27,000, we created 21,000. What do we wind up with? We wound up with a housing deficit of 6,000 homes, places for people to live, apartments, townhomes, condos, or single families that we did not create. And that was just for last year. 
What have I told you every single year I've been up here? We're not building enough homes. That is why you have an inventory issue. That's why you have not as many active listings as you need right now. That's why you're struggling with that. Every single time you've got a buyer, you don't have enough options, enough selections for, you, for those buyers. Because we've been doing this right here, this deficit thing, we've been doing this for the last five years, even, not even more, if not even more. Uh, why is that? Why, if the buyers are out there, why are we not building enough? Why has this happened year after year after year in this market? Any suggestions? So capital, lenders are not get, making enough capital available. Permitting process is a challenge. It takes longer to get permitting done. What else? A lot, a lot. lot availability. We just don't have enough. Why don't we have enough lots? It's been going on long enough. Why don't they build more subdivisions? Why is that taking so long to get more subdivisions into the, into the market? Same thing. Capital constraints, cash constraints, permitting constraints. Uh, many of the developers and... <coughs> Say again? <laughs> we have restrictions because of certain animals. But uh, I know where all the, uh, the little guys up in Georgetown, the salamanders that they're worried about, I know where all of them are. They're all at my house. I open the door and they're everywhere. I don't know what they're worried about. Um, so for a many reasons that in this market, we're going to continue to see constraints that keep them from building enough homes for what we are bringing in as far as the number of people and the number that uh, number of people that want to live someplace. I'm not sure where they're all living, where these 6,000 homes that we didn't build last year, where the people that would have gone in them are going. They're brooming up. They're living with their parents. You know that's going to get old eventually. Um, so you have a pent-up demand in this market, and it's a continuing pent-up demand that's carrying forward. So as you go into 2016, you have the same thing you had the last three or four years of a pent-up demand. You have a housing shortage. You have increased prices. Someone asked me the other day, you know, gosh, can prices keep going up? I said, supply and demand, absolutely. Prices will go up next year. You know, all your home values are going to go up. Well, they can't afford it. They'll find a way to afford it. They don't have any choice because there's more people than we have supply. We have more demand than we have supply. Yes? Is this, did these numbers of the new, new homes, does that include our MLS area or just? Well, this is the whole MSA, M, M, um, MLS area, the, the Metropolitan Statistical Area of Austin. So it includes, probably doesn't include Georgetown. That's not enough numbers that it matters. It includes Round Rock Cedar Park. It includes, uh, you know, on down into Hayes County part of area. So it's the whole 2 million population area here. Um, and uh, you're going to see that same dynamic playing out for this next year. So this last year, we wound up with a uh, percentage increase in medium home price. So medium home price is 259000 where it wound up, 7% increase. It was running at 8 and 9% throughout the year. But at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, it drops off a little bit as far as what your price increases are. So it averages out. The median for the whole year winds up being about 7%. What do I think is going to be this next year? I don't see how in the world it can be anything less than 7%. I'm just kind of praying it's only 7%. 7% is white hot. It is unsustainable at some point. There will come a point where if you increase 7% every year for the next decade, we're going to be at 500000 at 600000 for a median price home. That's going to have a very detrimental effect in our market if that happens. You'll be, at, you'll be California at that point for what your median prices are, and you'll have the California issues that they have. So I don't like seeing this at all. I would much rather see, if this were at 3%, that's almost three times what your uh, inflation rate is. Uh, you own the house for three years, you've covered your closing costs if you go to sell it, so there's no reason why this is a, would be a bad percentage if we were at 3%. And when it goes to that, if anyone complains about it, I'm going to come hurt them because there's nothing wrong with that. But we're not going to see it this next year because of the shortage, the housing shortage that's, that is just literally uh, impacting everything. You'll see multiple offers again this year. How many have had multiple offers so far this year? Look at those hands. As we go into the buying season, you're probably in worse shape for inventory than you were going into the buying season this time last year because of... What? 67,000 people that moved here last year. That number is driving everything. Plus, they have jobs. So those two numbers right there are driving everything. So there's my projections for next year. 70,000 new residents will create a little less uh, 
numbers of jobs, we're at the same percentage, a little less, 32,000 jobs, job growth rate at uh, 3.6 instead of 3.9. There's a slowdown in the overall economy I'm going to talk about for right now. Um, household income is 63,000. That's a very good household income for this market. Austin's actually an affordable place when you look at the median uh, income and median home price. We actually come out better than many other markets because even though markets have much better, better median home price, they might be down to 200000 on median home price, the incomes are much not as good, so they're worse. So the affordability is a function of those two numbers, and we actually still keep coming out as being a relatively affordable place. Now, if you're a low-income family, not nearly so much. If you're a low-income family trying to make uh, get by on one or two um, low incomes uh, in the family, then it's, you're very much challenged. Uh, what else for next year? Um, look at what the average tech job is. 20% of our entire market is tech jobs, and the median price for a tech job is $90,000 income. So uh, that is one of the things that drives this up. That drives up this household income in general. If you're looking at the largest area of growth is going to be in leisure and hospitality. Those jobs are paying around 43000 So if you're dealing with somebody that's in the highest growth area of our economy, the leisure and hospitality, uh, they're not going to be making 63000 as a household income. They're going to be making around 43000 Well, So they're going to be qualifying for a much different kind of home. Uh, I think that kind of covers anything. Look at what Texas is. We had 34,000 shortage. We have the same thing going on in Texas that we have in Austin. So we have uh, 200,000 households needed. We created 166,000 households, short 34,000. So you have the same dynamic going on all over Texas, the four major markets, just like you have going on in Austin. Yes? Is that number net gain, 67,000, 70,000, or it's just the number of people who moved in? That's net. So it's both births over deaths. So you become an adult and no one died out. So you've added to the population, the adult population has births over deaths. You finally got to 18. That's when we counted. And that you had a uh, net in migration. So that's net new residents to the market. So what does that take into account? Population? They are, but what we're counting this is, I mean, I'm counting it births over deaths, yeah. but we're also assuming that we had, we're having the same people enter into the, the number, same number entering into the adult population. Okay, let's look, at the, let's look at some of the bad. So that was the good, and I could just stop right there, and that's where I usually stop. <laughs> and you would have everything you need to know to be, probably operate for the rest of this year, and you probably would not even need to worry about the bad and the ugly. But there are some things going on in our global markets and in our U.S. market that is going to have some impact. Let's talk about probably what I think is going to be the biggest challenge in this market that you're going to struggle with. We, over the last seven years, we have really begun to price out of the market that lower income affordability issue. So you'll see conflicting headlines. Austin would actually qualify as being an affordable market because you're comparing it to the median family income. But that forgets and ignores the fact that you've got 50,000 families in this 2 million population that are working families, but they make minimum wage. Where are they going to live? They're going to rent. If they try to buy, it's a real struggle. They could used to do it. It's going to be much, much harder for them. Housing shortage, home prices will continue to rise. That's all good news for everyone in this room. It's good news for people who own homes. It's good news for people who are buying a home and ask you point blank, wow, how could prices keep going up if I miss the market? I think you can pretty confidently say, no, you've not missed the market. You buy now, you're going to get appreciation. You should buy a home to live in. You should not buy a home necessarily for investment. We talk about investments, but it's really your home. But if it does increase in value, that's not a bad thing. And you're going to see that happen this next year. Lot shortage, there's just not enough new homes being built. Most builders would say, I could, I, could sell, I could sell more if I could get more built. They may struggle about which the price points are, where they are, and where that fits into, and be concerned about that. But we see more builders coming into the market. I mean, I already got some builders that are struggling and they can't buy enough lots. And then I turn it right around and I see two new builders coming into the market starting from scratch to go find lots. And so now all those existing builders are now competing with even more builders about who's going to get the lots. 
So there's a real land grab, a real struggle to, to sna uh, snap up more and more of the lots. Price point shortage, I'm going to show you limited supply of the right priced homes for where all those buyers are. So yes, you've got 67,000 people coming into the market, 35,000 of them have jobs. Those 35,000 jobs are all wanting some place to live, Most, uh, maybe at least 27 to 37,000. Do they all fit the exact price ranges that are available to sell? No, not all that is a perfect matchup. So that's kind of the struggle that you have. We're going to talk about home ownership rate for just a minute. We're going to talk about trends with millennials. Trends of millennials, this is the more renters by choice for now. All the studies we see of the millennials, they are not buying homes as quickly as prior generations did when they got to certain ages. A lot of reasons for that. A lot of reasons are talked about, and some of them are then, the very next headline refutes it. So you can see all kinds of things. They've got too much student debt. They saw the housing recession, and they were kind of uh, turned off by it. I had a developer talking to me the other day that had um, built some micro units, so 350 square foot apartments to 500 square foot apartments. I used to call those efficiencies when I grew up. <laughs> now they're very cleverly designed to have flex furniture and and lofts and all kinds of things in them, and you still live in 500 or less square feet, and they call it a micro apartment. And they've got micro apartments being built in downtown Austin. Uh, so that uh, it fits what the millennial is wanting to rent or possibly buy as a condo. And uh, my com his commentary was that stuff and things are not that important to the millennials. It's like, well, I've got a millennial in my family and it seems very important to him, but whatever. <laughs> uh, he's not quite getting the memo. But he said, you know, they, he said, you know, all the studies just show that there's a, there is a very delayed uh, reaction on the part of this whole millennial group, which is the larger than the baby boomers. This whole uh, cohort is larger than the baby boomers group, and they are waiting longer to get married, waiting longer to have families, and they are more into experiences and more into uh, shared services. So they don't mind having all their a uh, place where they congregate be not in their home but in common areas within the micro unit tower or in the restaurants or bars or whatever and they do that longer. My dad called that failure to launch <laughs> and wanting and wanting to uh, and the Peter Pan syndrome but apparently it's now been completely uh, okay and we're now pandering to all that. It does, the, the numbers do show that the millennials are buying. They're finally definitely getting to the 33, 34, 35. They're getting their raises. They're getting promotions. They're now looking at buying. There is a pent up demand among that group for all of you as you're targeting and doing your prospecting. There is a pent up demand that that group is going to start buying, but NAR keeps going, polling them and asking, when, when are you gonna buy? <laughs> they're, not, they're not buying as quickly as what everyone thought. So here's Austin. This is kind of the big story here. Look at this 100,000, 160,000 range. Uh, we used to have, just back in 2010, we had 25% of our market was in that range. That has dropped down to now 10% of the market in that range. That's pretty dramatic if you're in that, um, if you're in that price 40, 45,000 household income. You know, that's where you need to be buying, or you're just barely, you can barely get into this next bracket where you now only have 15% of what that total is. You have in the, so if you add this bracket, that's what, 3.5% plus 10, 13.5% of the total market is 100, between 0 and 160,000. 13% and 160,000. So that's pretty, watching this and seeing and understanding what this dynamic is really will help you understand because now if you go up to this next bracket of 200,000, we have 13% total up to there. We add another 16%. So you have 13 and 16%, 30% that you've got, 29% um, that you've got in, uh, that's available to you of homes in those price ranges, which fits, you know, many of your buyers. And they're scrambling to be able to get access to what those homes are, and they're not located where the schools are that they want and everything else. So those are some big challenges. More renters by choice for now because they don't want to buy. When they get into the market of buying, they struggle with this whole issue right here, first-time home buyers. Uh, those are just some challenges. I think that 
I've always been here the last two to three years. I just think that they're becoming more pronounced. So as you get into 2016 and 17, this is some, an area I would highlight as the bad, that you need to be paying more attention to, working your business around how you work around this. Here's something else that is impacting us in Texas and in Austin and in nationwide. And this is part of it's the millennials. Part of it is all the other population. This is our home ownership rate percentage. So of our population, what percentage owns a home? And go back to 1965, this was uh, kind of where we were. Uh, we got, went from 63% up to 65.5%, uh, dropped down in the 80s. Uh, women really began to get into the market uh, much more so with jobs and began to drive the home ownership rate up among other things. As you kind of got to the right around in here, the federal government and both parties and FHA and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac all began to come out with more and more policies of, you know what, the solution to everything is everyone needs to own a home. Not everyone needs to own a home. Not everyone can own a home. Not everyone's prepared to own a home. And if you go give them a loan that they can't qualify for, and you put them in a house that they can't pay even the curtains for, much less the landscaping, much less the tax dollars for, you're going to have a problem. So we kept driving this rate up to an artificial high of 69.2%. And that's when the bottom fell out. That's one of the reasons the bottom fell out. There's many reasons, but this is actually one of the reasons that the bottom fell out of our market. And it has really crashed since then. This actually began to go down before the recession hit. The recession hit about right here. We already were seeing some, we, we, had, we had gone too far. We had really gone way out on a limb. And this was Republicans and Democrats both sang this song and said, this, was, this is the American dream. This is what we should really go. NAR was really behind this. National Home Builder Association really behind this. And that's fine. It's the American dream. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't get into a home unless you really can actually handle being a homeowner. We should draw the line there. So this has really plummeted. But there was other, there's something else that's been going on with this. This wasn't just a correction. There's a systemic change within our society that has gone on. There are, um, between the um, baby boomers not necessarily getting into or retiring in a way and not necessarily owning a home, between the millennials not buying a home, and between other factors which I can't really even pinpoint. I've done a lot of research on this, and no one's really got a great answer why this has plummeted so much. It's more than a correction. There is a systemic change in our society that owning a home is not the thing that as many people are doing as they were doing in the past. So that takes, if you just were doing the math on it, between our 330 million population or our civilian population, the adults 18 to 65, not in prison and not in the military, uh, which is probably around 250 million. If you took the percentage of that, if we were back up to the ownership percentage of, let's say, go back here to the 80s, in the 66% range versus the 64, that 2% or 3%, that's a lot of homes. That's a lot of homes that are not being bought in this nation right now. And the numbers, the graph for Texas is about the same thing. The graph for Texas is actually below this percentage and kind of follows like that. So we're actually in Texas down to about 62% for home ownership rate in Texas. We're below what the national average is. So that's another change that's happening, and it actually takes uh, home ownership purchases out of the market that could be in the market right now. And it's something to kind of watch. They have seen it tick up and they actually think it's bottomed out. We'll see. We also thought that when it did that right there, and it didn't do that, it went, and dropped on back down. So uh, we'll see as it goes forward over throughout this year and next year, if it starts coming back up a little bit, or at least it bottoms out and stays there. Yes? So what does that mean for investors? Is that a good sign or a bad sign for somebody that wants to buy an investment property? In which market? In our current market. Great. Investors should invest in this market. I mean, this is a good market. What does it mean for other markets? It's really been a big impact in some other markets. Yeah, it's pushing the first-time home buyers 
scammed about that out because they can't get a loan. Or they, yeah. they're coming in with a loan and don't have the cash. Well, you know, one of the things you could say is that our during this period of time, our underwriting standards for loans have gotten much tougher. You could also say that, and that's actually kept some first-time home buyers out of the market. So kind of playing off what you just said, that could be part of what's going on here. Certainly, we know underwriting standards are higher. We know it's harder to get qualified for a loan. Some of that was very justified. We needed to increase the standards. Well, Investors are also driving up the price right. in this market and other markets, probably more so in this market. That whole increase that we've seen in the median family income, median home price, up to 259000 I mean, Dallas and Houston, you're down to like 220000 200000 190000 in those markets for a median home price. Austin's home price has really increased a great amount. Our average, that's the median, our average is 350000 So some of that has been the investor markets, investors coming into this market and buying into the market because why? I don't have rents up here, but what have rents done in this market? Yeah. The rents have gone through the roof in this market. Mm -hmm. And you've got a $400,000 off of cash and someone trying to get a loan. So I think that's pushing a big segment of buyers. Now, I don't have the percentage of investors in this market. You all have got that in MLS. You can probably pull that out better than I can. But we clearly we know for the last three or four years, anytime you see rents going up the way they have, rents, uh, we started this whole thing. When, it, when we came right out of the recession, rents were like around $0.80 cents per 1000 So if you had a 1000 square foot apartment, it's 800 bucks. Rents are now average across this market of $1.35, so $1,300 for a 1,000 square foot apartment. That's average. If you want, to, if it's in a desirable area, it's probably a buck eighty-five. So now we're up in a desirable area. A thousand square foot is eighteen hundred bucks. If you're downtown, what is it? Two dollars and seventy-five cents to three dollars and fifty cents. Three dollars fifty cents. That's thirty-five hundred dollars for a thousand square foot apartment. Why are those people not buying a home? You know, you said that you look at that and go. Just a little bit of a commute, you can have quite a home. I mean, come on, for 3500 bucks, All of you all could do that math for them very, very quickly. But in this market, people want to pay those rents. And, they, and they, investors buy them, people rent them, and the rents just keep going up. Rents are projected to go up next year. It's just amazing to me. Uh, traffic. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Traffic is not going to keep people from coming here. Every place they're coming from, the traffic is probably worse. But I'm going to put this on the agenda this year because... It's getting bad. <laughs> there are, you just look at what we're doing. MOPAC will be, a, will be a significant impact of good positive impact. When they get that completed, they're definitely behind. Yeah, yeah it's going to happen. <laughs> no crosstown freeways drives me crazy. What, are, what have we been thinking about the last 40 years that we will not put a crosstown freeway in? 360 should be a controlled access. That's not even on the radar screen. 620 is just slow. Uh, 620 should have work done on it. I don't see that being even projected. I-35 needs to be expanded. We need to be spending billions of dollars on I-35. TxDOT just allocated 1.3 billion to Texas. Austin got 158 million of it for three intersections on I-35. You know, the entire project for I-35 that needs to get done is like $4 billion. We're not doing it. Denver passed a $4 billion bond for their traffic to help work on their traffic. And Austin would have a coronary if you proposed a $4 billion traffic bond. If we don't do it, though, we're, it's going to grind to a halt at some point. Not next year, not the year after, not the year after. But it's going to be, begin to be noticeable, and I'm sure you're gonna, probably going to, at the very least, be impacted in your own business. It's just harder to get around town now than it has ever been. We'll get some new tollways. 183 South is going to be a phenomenal success, and that's going to be a tollway. It's going to get you to the airport from I-35 on 183. Uh, it's going to be, uh, that, that is all already all done and paid for. That's going to start pretty soon. Yes, back in the back. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, 130 has been a big success in the grand scheme of things. It started off slower than they expected. Uh, if you go, if you drive 130 now, there's times when it's actually got traffic on it. I've actually been running at 30 miles an hour in 130, going, "What happened here?" I can see them actually expanding 130 in the not too far off future. If you punched, uh, you know, bringing 290 over to it really made a big impact. All that Mainer and 290, that's all. Yes, that's quite hot. The build out through there, Pflugerville, all that is going to be. 
really huge, all of it, just because you got that roadway going out. Uh, a lot of work continuing on 71 that will help, uh, but what they need is to bring 936 or whatever it is down MLK and bring it right into downtown, and that would, that would really be a significant impact, but none of that's planned. The way the tollways work is it's all managed by the regional mobility group, and can you put that back in? I've now managed to, I've now managed to take the cover off and make the battery pop out. Um, <laughs> 130, uh, the way the, the tollways are all managed by this uh, regional mobility uh, group, and they will go where they're asked to go. So if the community in the city asked to go in and build 360 out as a tollway, they do it. And they can, they can raise the money. They oversold the 183 by tenfold. There were ten times the number of investors wanting to do 183 extension and the 183 south. There's, and this is worldwide money. The, Austin is seen as a wonderful place to put in tollways, but you've got to get the community to, per, to participate in it. We can solve it all by tollways if the city get behind it, but that's probably not the best way of handling it, by putting everything in tollway, yes. Is, is it just Austin that it seems that every new road improvement, and I don't mean just new roads, but I mean road improvement even, like the 183, seems to be tolled? What's, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, why are we having so many tollways instead of having free tollways? There's no more federal money. Federal money's all gone. Is that, is that like all over the place? Yeah, or is that just well, nationwide. Okay. Yeah, nationwide. Uh, there are tollways going in everywhere. Uh, the, the days of the federal government having any kind of money, you know, uh, they just announced this morning, I was walking in, the 2016 projected deficit under Obama's budget is going to far exceed anything we've ever seen. Uh, federal government spending us into complete debt but well, it's not just them. Republicans spend, as everyone spends this in, spends a deficit, and it's all getting worse. So the highway monies, those are all gone. So this is all going to be state money or local money. It's not going to be federal money anymore. So you're going to be doing tollways. So this is kind of, I, I don't want to belabor this point. This really doesn't affect you much this next year. It's just beginning to be an issue. I just couldn't help from putting it up here. Let's look at the ugly part. If I can get this to you thought, you thought that was the ugly part. Here's the ugly part. Let's talk about oil. So uh, oil doesn't seem to impact us that much so far. But I want to talk about a few things that over the next 12 months, the next 18, next 24 months, could in fact impact us enough that you'll see it on the local level. Not trying to be a scaremonger, but at the same time, there are some serious issues going on. In the past, had we had this kind of drop in oil, Houston would be on its knees. It's much more diversified, so is Texas, so we are surviving this in a much better shape. And it's tempted to be lulled into believing that, well, you know, we, we're going to handle this. Well, just wait around until oil goes back up, and then everything's going to be wonderful. And that may actually be what happens. But there are some factors going on that are driving this that may, may not get there. And here's the biggest issue. So you see, you follow what the uh, world, the green line, you follow what the green line is. I can't operate this thing. And generally, we've had more consumption than we had production. And we had a little bit more production there than consumption during that uh, period of time in the early, what, 2014. And then we hit this whole period of time here. So what happened here, we kept hearing all these things about how we're going to run out of oil, peak oil, we're going to run out of oil, we're going to run out of oil. How in the world can we produce more oil than we consume, considering our consumption has gone from 87 million barrels per day back in 2010, to now we're up uh, knocking on the door of, so this is, consumption is the green, so we're knocking on the door of 96 million barrels. So our consumption has continued to climb, but production outpaced it. What happened to all that? How did all that happen? Fracking. Let's walk through it. Fracking is one of them. Fracking, let's talk about fracking for just a minute. The U.S. went to being the world's, the world's second or first oil producer. How did that happen? We went from, we've added another 4 million barrels per day that we're producing. And we're still producing them even though we stopped drilling for fracking, all those fracking wells are still producing. So we have slowed down in drilling new wells, so eventually we'll begin to see our production tail off. But we've really flooded the market. We, not OPEC, us, are the ones that flooded the market with oil. But we weren't the only ones. Venezuela had a huge oil play and oil strike over this last decade. They've started producing more oil. Russia took all of our technology that we developed for fracking, applied it to their reserves. They've had huge amount of production. 
Iraq has really come online with a huge amount of production. And now Iran, who's been held back for five years from producing because of sanctions, now I don't have any sanctions on them, they're ramping up production. So you have got a lot of issues that are impacting things, and nobody wants to stop producing. Everybody wants to keep producing for all kinds of reasons. No one wants to be the first one to, to cut back and only see everybody else produce. So you see what happened to the oil price here. As soon as that production began to have more production than what consumption was, our price plummeted. So it's pretty much driven by supply and demand, and that's not going to solve itself, certainly within the next probably 12 months, is everything that you can read. You're not going to see that happen. So given enough time, will that impact things in Texas? I don't know. This is a grand experiment. We've never, we've never had this kind of a shock in price of oil in which Texas didn't go into a recession. We're not in a recession. In fact, we're standing in Austin to have one of our best years this next year. But I would not want to, I would not want to fail to talk about this. This is also being driven by a drop in consumption. So our consumption isn't as intense, even though this is pretty intense. It should have been more so because China and several other countries were really ramping up their economies, their GDP was ramping up, and all of a sudden, as you've seen what's happened in the stock market, all their numbers about world growth and growth in China and growth in many other countries has really slowed down. Slowed down before all of this hit, but then you add in the fact that these other countries were balancing their checkbook with oil. So <coughs> Russia, for instance, 50% of its whole income that it used to balance its budget was from oil. And of course, what happens when you have that? You go spend it. So they're used to spending it. They did it on military. They've done it on social services. They've done it on all kinds of things. And now they're, it's down to only 35%, making up 35%. They're, they're running big deficits. Uh, Saudi Arabia is running a deficit. They're going to burn through $70 billion in cash already that they burned through. They've got, if you can believe this, Saudi Arabia has $740 billion in cash. But guess what? If they st oil stays this way for five years, they'll actually burn through all of that cash that they have. Are they going to let that happen? Probably not. There's probably going to finally be some things that everyone starts doing to put a stop to that. Number one, number one they've got to stop spending so much money. Iraq, although is doing really well at ramping up their production, they have no cash. They have no cash reserves. Brazil, Libya, Nigeria, Venezuela. Venezuela hit the big oil strike. They started spending all the money. They're in significant or serious financial condition caused by the loss of revenue. They keep spending, but they don't have that revenue coming in because these are all the these countries all, all all own all those oil reserves. They own the oil companies. U.S. is in a much much, much better shape because. That is, we have whole processes for that. We'll just simply let those companies go bankrupt that uh, run out of any kind of uh, cash or run out of anything else. You can't have these countries going bankrupt. They just simply go into massive t political turmoil. Uh, we're oversupplying the market right now, one and a half to two million barrels per day of oversupply. The other thing to really realize in this, we only started producing a little more than about 2% more than what we were consuming. And as soon as we hit that 1.5% to 2%, that's when the price plummeted. That's a pretty sensitive pricing range. That's a pretty volatile market. It goes the other way. If our consumption goes back above our production because production drops or our consumption increases just 1.5% or 2%, price of oil will, sh will rocket up, back up. So it's that last bit of oil that gets produced whether it's over or under consumption. Consumption is not going to really change too much. It's just whatever it is. Uh, it uh, makes a big impact. For the rest of the U.S., having low oil prices, there's probably 70 different products that are made with oil, uh, oil and oil uh, petroleum products, so that's actually a good thing. So there's a balancing out effect. I think even the Texas has had a balancing out effect of some of that. But you're just, you just need to really be aware as you're going through this year that there are some massive impacts that are going on in the world and in, uh, uh, in, in, er and in the U.S. Uh, part of what I think is making the stock market go down is that the world growth, the GDP is slowing down. And when you have this going on with your cash reserves, that tends to slow down your GDP. That tends to slow down the growth of your country. So they've also dealing with uh, spinoff impacts from that. China has been in the 8, 10, 12% growth rate U.S. is having to do 4% growth rate. 
uh, three and a half, four percent. China can't sustain that. They did that for decades now. They have all clearly said that they're not going to be able to sustain 8% growth rate. So it's going to start dropping down below that as they go forward. That's going to mean that they use less oil. So there could be some, some complicating factors with all that. That was only about eight slides. I did a lot of discussion for it. When you get the slides, you can kind of go through it and kind of recall what some of the discussion was. I tried to boil it down to just maybe some four or five big points for what you look at as you go through the rest of this year. And if you got any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Any other questions? Yeah.